60 years ago in 1953, the first Chevrolet Corvette went on sale, and it's been on sale ever since. I think that makes it the longest model in continuous production ever in the entire world. To celebrate that 60th anniversary, the Peterson Automotive Museum has organized an exhibit of some historically very important Corvettes, and they've brought in some experts who can tell us about them. Let's take a look at some of these cars in chronological order and journey through the history of the Corvette. This is the EX122, and it's said to be the first Corvette ever. What does that mean as first Corvette, Leslie? Well, this really is the first Corvette ever. This is the prototype that actually debuted at the 1953 General Motors Motorama uh, in January. And the public so overwhelmingly liked this car that General Motors did something that they had never done before, and that spool it up for production in a matter of only months. And by the end of the year, they had built 300 of them and gotten into the hands of customers. What was the Motorama? General Motors Motorama was a show that they put on every year from 1949 to 1961 uh, in, in which they debuted their special prototypes, their special dream cars, uh, along with production cars. They got people to come in to look at the dream cars and then they would uh, give them the chance to sell them what they were producing that year. Well, this looks like a 53 Corvette, and I'm not an expert at it, but I notice details like these scoops and a few other things that don't seem quite right. What are the parts of this car that are, that are really different from the real 53 production car? Well, this car so appealed to enthusiasts that Chevrolet decided to put it in production virtually unchanged. But there are some, some little differences, like you pointed out, the, the fender scoops, the side trim is a little bit different. There's Chevrolet or Corvette script on the front. The uh, headlight screens are hinged in a different way. And, there's, and the sculpting of the side is just a little bit different than, than the production version. What about those fins around the taillights? Did those make it into production? Those made it into production. So I guess you could say that a 1953 4 and 5 Corvette has four fins, two on each side. And what's under the hood of this uh, EX122? Well, what's under the hood is a, is a regular Chevrolet engine. It's a blue flame six with three carburetors. After all, this was a Chevrolet, and, and they wanted to give it that division identity. But this car ended up with a, a V8 in it because it, it was used as a test bed afterwards. Um, General Motors was, did not know that this was going to be extremely important. They did not think to save it. Um, it was just another concept car, like a racing car. You know, when it when it's time and when its day in the sun was over, that was it. Just put it away or or use it for a better purpose. So so they use this as a test mule for a lot of uh, engineering things. So originally it had the six cylinder with a power glide, but you're saying they tested what the prototype small block in here? I don't know that it was a prototype small block, but I do know that they tested a V8 engine. I wouldn't be surprised that that's exactly what it was. And how did a car like this that was used for display and testing end up surviving in such pristine condition? Well, I don't think it survived in pristine condition. I think it was brought back to pristine condition uh, once the you know, once the, the history of the car got out, people understood what it was and they said, wait a minute, this is too important not to bring back to its Motorama uh, appearance and condition. What a wonderful piece of history. It really is. It's an extraordinary piece of history. And it's very, uh, it, it speaks to a time when the um, Detroit manufacturers were really, really listening to, to Americans and, and looking at Europe and seeing that Americans were so interested in what was coming over from Europe that they wanted to be ready with the sports car just in case this really took off. And it survived for 60 years. And it survived for 60 years. And my hunch is it'll, it'll go for at least another 60. So let's move on to the next car, a 56 Corvette that's actually a very special racing car called the SR2. And it really looks like some wild styling model, but it was actually a racing car. And to tell me about it, we've got Carpo Mercajanian, and he organized a gathering of Corvette enthusiasts that kicked off this Corvette exhibit at the Peterson Museum. Carpo, what is this car? This car was uh, special ordered by uh, Jerry Earl. It was uh, son of Harley Earl, who was the GM stylist. And uh, he ordered it and he raced it for two seasons. It's one of two high fin cars, uh, fuel injected, had a special well, custom trans four speed transmission. 
in Halibrand Wheels, and they raced it for two seasons, and then from then it went to uh, Jim Jeffords, who um, raced it as called the Purple People Eater. I've got to believe, though, that Earl had some influence in the look of this car because, you know, he was the head of GM styling for, what, 30 years or something. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. really had a long tenure. And this fin, I mean, these fins were sort of popular in the 50s, but I think this is one of the biggest ones I've ever seen. Oh, I agree with you. It's pretty big. <laughs> Do you think this served any real purpose on the car? Um, I don't believe it did. They were trying different things out back then, uh, but I don't really think it did. Uh, you mentioned that it had a fuel-injected engine. Later on, production Corvettes got fuel injection. Was, do you think this was a prototype of the production it system? Ha it had to have been because in 57, that's when the first fuel injectors came out for Corvettes. And that was really pretty early for Corvette. I mean, there weren't a lot of cars on the market with fuel injection at all then, were there? No, there weren't. Yeah, Chevrolet was really at the cutting edge with this car. When, when you look at a, this interior too, you see that tachometer, almost like the type of tachometer that's bolted onto the steering column, mm -hmm. except it seems built in. Yeah, you can barely see the speedometer. And it seems to have the uh, auxiliary instruments there, just yes. like a real race car. Right. And an extinguisher in there. Yeah, and you can obviously see the plexiglass little windscreens, which probably didn't help probably any at all. Oh, of course. I mean, maybe it kicked the air over your head, right. but you don't know that for sure. Well, this car survived very well for a real race car. It must have un undergone some serious restoration at I, some point. I believe it's gone through a full restoration, sure. This is unlike any Corvette I've seen. It's called the Serve One, and I'm here with its owner, Mike Yeager. Mike owns Mid-America Corvettes. It's the largest supplier of Corvette parts and accessories in the country. And you supply parts for all vintages, don't you? All vintage, 53 to soon to be 2014. Well, that's terrific. Uh, you own this car. Tell us about it. Well, I bought the car in June of 1996. And, you know, it's interesting in that a significant car like this was for sale. It was on the marketplace. And one day I just woke up and said, this car needs to be in my collection. And when Zora first uh, conceived this car, it was and built... You mean, you mean Zora Arcus Duntoff, who was uh, chief engineer of Corvette back in the 50s? Yes, I do. And this was his favorite car. The car was designed to the 1959 IndyCar specs. And the concept behind an engineering research vehicle like this was to test drive lines, tires, uh, obviously wheel, tire wheel configurations, but most importantly, this was a test bed for what ended up being the 1963 through 82 uh, independent rear suspension Corvette. So even though this to the uh, average consumer does not look like a Corvette, this is Corvette through and through. Zora's idea of perhaps getting a car to run at Indy under the GM banner, but uh, that fell through, but the car's still here. Well, it's called the Serve One, and that stands for Chevrolet Engineering Research Vehicle, right? Number one. Okay, number one. And at the time, Corvettes didn't have independent rear suspension, and they certainly weren't mid-engined and still haven't been. So you're saying that the idea here was to test IRS and a few other Absolutely. technical aspects? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the inter we've had this car apart and looking at how it was put together. You know, the uh, transmission's just bolted right up to the rear end. I mean, everything's compact. Uh, the chassis is so interesting. It's lightweight. Uh, the, the brakes are outboard on the car. Just, you know, really, really well ahead of its time. It's got an early version of an ABS brake bias system on it. So when you drive the car, you can... Uh, alter the, the front the rear bias on the brakes? Yeah, absolutely, and that was certainly in 1959 was way ahead of its time. Now tell us about the engine in this car. Well, this is, this is the engine number seven. Uh, in the life of this car and testing, we have records of every motor that was ever in this car. And when it left Chevrolet, it ended up with a 377 Grand Sport with the Hilburn injection on it. And it's actually uh, set up to run on something other than gasoline. So what, you mean uh, alcohol? <laughs> alcohol. As they were using in Indy, is that Absolutely. the idea? Absolutely. And, and, uh, so this is a small block Chevy. Small block 377. But set up for racing. Set up for racing. How, how much power do you think this makes? Oh, I'm going to guess in the low 600s, and that's back in uh, the early 60s. It actually ran at Pikes Peak Hill Climb, and it was a little bit off timing, so Chevrolet just packed the car up and took it home. 
And when they got back to Detroit, they found out there was a timing error, and it had actually set a new track record for climbing the mountain. Who drove it in that uh, Pikes Peak one? Zora Arcus Duntop. Himself. And interesting being here at the Peterson Automotive Museum, this car kind of is almost home. It ran in 1961 at the Riverside Grand Prix, and a gentleman by the name of Sterling Moss drove the car two, three laps prior to the Formula One race. Tell me about that steering wheel. That almost looks like a stock steering wheel. Is well, that the connection know, to the Corvette of the day? Yeah, right. The, uh, you know, every car has a story. And this car was designed uh, by Larry Shinoda. And he and Zora got into a discussion about the width of the cockpit. Larry wanted it smaller. And Zora wanted, he was the European big driver. Well, you can see who uh, who won, won the, the battle. But, but Zora car. wasn't a big guy. Uh. He wasn't, but when Zora drove, it was the elbows out the side of the steering wheel. And, you know, I, I, when I bought this car, and on the other side of the car are two inputs for a battery charger. And to start this car, they had to put a, a, a power supply to it and start it. And when you, when you put that on there, you think, who touched this? I mean, you know, any historical car, you have to say, what, not only what is the history, but who were the celebrities? Who were the stars involved? And, and it's an eerie feeling to sit in the car and know that you're sitting in probably one of General Motors' most uh, historic, valuable vehicles. That raises the point of how you came to own this car, because these types of engineering vehicles often aren't let out by car companies. So how did you manage to acquire this one? Well, Serve 1 and 2 were Zora's favorite Corvettes, and General Motors had ordered the cars destroyed, so he took them home and put them in his garage. Really? And then when the heat kind of settled down, General Motors had decided to donate them to the Briggs Cunningham Museum. And from the Briggs Cunningham Museum, they went to Miles Collier's Museum in uh, Florida. From there, they went into uh, two guys that were collecting Corvettes. And they went up for sale, and the sale was blocked for about three years. And after that was settled, the car went on the open market. And, you know, interesting, I, I paid, you know, I'm proud to say I paid $225,000 for the car in 1996. Most expensive car I'd ever bought. And I was so proud of it. And I can tell you, I've had offers uh, greater than 10 times that for the car. But I'm a collector, not a seller. So that's why I'm here with the car, because it's mine, and I enjoy sharing it with people. And Does it still run? It still runs. About five years ago, we took it to uh, Putnam Park in Indiana, and uh, Alan Duquesne drove the car, Elaine Duquesne. And uh, he was about 110, 120 in the car on these tires. Wow. And it's an old car, so I, it runs and runs well. I, I've driven a few historic cars, and that's one of the things you always worry about, the tires, because, you know, a car's yeah. been sitting in a museum, oh, even if it's well kept up, but yeah. the tires kind of deteriorate, and often these cars can go a lot faster than their older tires can go. You know, I drove this car once on the street next to Elfie Duntov and her 1955 Corvette, and when she looked at the car, I know it took 25, 30 years. The smile was 25 to 30 years younger because she knew that this was Zora's favorite car and to see it being driven right beside her, it was just an awesome experience. This is a 1962 big tank Corvette and there's a lot to talk about that, but. As you can see, this looks a lot different than that SR2 and the original 53 Corvette. How did these styling variations come up, and how different is a 62 from an early one or even from a 60? Well, a 62 is completely different from the doors back. A 61 and 62 are completely different from the doors back. They resemble uh, like a 63 and six to 67 Corvette. Okay. And how about uh, in the 61s, were, the 60s were a lot more curving in the back than this one? Yes, you can see on this car over here, the white one, the 60, it completely different, very, very curvy in the back. And I noticed this is called a big tank car, and it seems to have this special fuel filler. What does all that signify? Uh, this is a factory race car built uh, and you could buy, and it had a big tank, it had a 25 gallon tank, and it had big brakes for racing, and plus it's fuel injected. Okay, so it was designed for endurance racing, basically, with that Correct. big tank? Correct, yes. And I noticed this has steel wheels on it. Why mm -hmm. is that? For a race car. For a race car, you didn't want hubcaps flying off. Ah, okay. And it was a property, you know. Was, you just wanted to put a basic wheel on it for racing. And it w was part of that because you were probably going to put a mag on it anyways once you got it out onto the track? Right. 
Okay, so this had a fuel-injected V8. Was that uh, 327 by 1962? Yes, it was. Now, do you think this car was actually raced, or this one went into a collection, even though it had all the race equipment? I can almost guarantee you it was raced. Really? Yeah. And how does it end up with the window sticker still on the window? Well, somebody, they obviously kept the window sticker, and it passed along with the car. You have to understand, these cars weren't, if, if they were in personal hands, obviously, because they were factory-built race cars, you can buy them, but they didn't drive them all the time. So they probably had records of everything they did to this car when they raced. I noticed this uh, stickered for $5,509, which seems dirt cheap today, but back in 62, that was probably a fairly expensive car. It's probably double from what a regular car, uh, passenger car would be. Now we're going to go take a look at our first C2 Corvette, and it's a special 1964 model that was built for the World's Fair at New York. This is the 64 World's Fair Corvette, and I know it's a special car, but before you tell me how special it is, this is the first C2 we've looked at. How did the C2 differ from the C1? I can say night and day, but you know, the uh, 62 Corvette still, I think of the Route 66, you know, the older, that first generation of Corvette with the, the big side coves. This was like the current 2014, a complete new model, top to bottom, new chassis, new body, new styling, the uh, 63 Stingray with the split window, the iconic Corvette, and unfortunately this is a 64, but still an awful special car. Well, and one of the keys on the C2 was the Corvette got independent rear suspension, oh, which made it fully modern for the day. Absolutely, and you know, these cars today still look good on the road, and I think when you look at design, a car that can be 50 years old and still work on the road today, that's when you know that styling and design is right. Now tell us what makes this particular car so special and why is this the World's Fair car? Well, this was at uh, the New York World's Fair in Flushing Meadows for about a year, sitting in GM's display. So they dialed, up, dialed it up, they put, uh, cut the fuel injection unit, uh, raised it up, cut it and put it through the hood. It's got spatial side pipes on it. Uh, most significant, it's got a 50-year-old candy apple red paint job on it that just, in the daylight and in the sunlight, this car will just knock your socks off. And this is still the original paint job? This is an unrestored Un car? Unrestored interior and exterior. Now, you, you mentioned the fuel-injected engine. Uh, a fuel-injected engine was a factory option on these cars, but it didn't normally poke through the hood. No, it just had the hood coming back, so that's always an eye-catcher. You know, when, when General Motors and Chevrolet do a... Uh, a styling car, it's always something to catch your, the imagination, the looks, the what's different about this car, what's unique, and this car certainly has that appeal. Well, same thing on the side pipes. I mean, you could get side pipes, but they didn't come through that side no, coat, did that's, they? that's pretty spatial. They did a lot of work to cut the fenders and to mold that in there, and uh, you know, everything on these 64 cars, they would take, there was about nine of these cars, and they took all kinds of unique features of the cars and cut them up and changed them to make uh, spatial cars. The 63 Corvette was such a hit, they followed it up with this series of styling cars. What's special on the back? What's special on the back, obviously this comes from the Stingray Racer. There's uh, the cooling vents that bring air out and three tail lights and they're done in aluminum with reverse lenses on them. They just did unique little styling tricks to the car to capture your imagination. I, I, I have the sense some customizers picked up on those six tail I lights and put think, them on production cars. I think cars. you're exactly right. Or maybe General Motors picked it up from the customizers. There you go. How about inside the car? Inside the car, they matched it with the candy apple red. They did a lot of aluminum features. These lights actually sequence when the door is open. So okay. The uh, traffic is coming on, they see the lights, the dash is aluminum, they put high back leather seats, the glove box is leather padded, the console is leather, just things that you would not see on a typical production Corvette in 1964. And these mirrors look uh, a little smaller than normal uh, too. Functionality, I don't think they were <laughs> top of the game, but looks wise, that's what they decided would be the best on the car. Cool car. Thank you. This is the 1959 Corvette Italia by Scaglietti. 
Scaglietti is an Italian coach builder, and this sure looks like an Italian car, not like a Corvette. I've got Leslie Kendall here, the curator of the museum, and maybe he can tell me how we got a Corvette that looked like a Ferrari. Well, I'll be thrilled. Uh, a lot of people thought that it would make a great pairing to put a the most high-performance American chassis with a sexy Italian body. Uh, because a lot of people like the idea of, of reliable underpinnings but exotic looks. And this combines those two. This takes the most, the most technologically advanced Corvette from 1959, a fuel-injected car, and puts probably some of the most exotic, sexy coachwork on it from the era by Scaglietti. Now, was the intent to actually produce these in series production and it didn't work out, or what happened here? Well, if Carroll Shelby had his way, there'd be Shelby Corvettes and not Shelby Cobras, because he had a lot to do with this. Him, Jim Hall, and Gary Laughlin. Uh, they all got together and they, they all had their own input into this project. Um, but there were a couple of snags they hit along the way. Uh, Chevrolet really didn't want to support the project because they were already selling enough Corvettes. They could sell as many as they could build and they didn't really want to divert chassis to, to Italy to have them specially bodied. They didn't feel that they needed to do that to sell cars. And uh, another rumor has it that uh, Enzo Ferrari came into Scaglietti's workshop, saw him working on a plebeian American car, and said, if you're going to keep doing those, then you're not going to do any more cars for me. And so Scaglietti apparently thought twice about it and said, OK, I get it. I won't do any more of these. So three ended up being built. Well, I'm not surprised that Ferrari got uh, upset with this, because when I look at this car, things like, you know, these side scoops and the big hood scoop and the headlights, I mean, it looks just like a, a Ferrari of the day, doesn't it? This is as sexy as any Italian car of its day, any Ferrari, any Maserati, you name it. And the fact that it's on reliable American underpinnings makes it that much more desirable to people in America. How did you guys get a hold of this car? Mr. Peterson actually bought this in a private transaction some years ago. Carpo, this 63 Grand Sport has to be one of the most iconic Corvettes. I mean, it's visually almost overwhelming. Mm -hmm. What's with this car? One of five factory race cars built um, was uh, secretly done without GM management knowing about it. And uh, it had a lot of press when it came out. Why did they have to do it secretly? Because the AMA, AMA banned uh, race, uh, this style of racing. Okay, and so uh, since they banned it, GM management would not have approved this car, so it was done kind of surreptitiously? Correct. And what about all this styling stuff? I mean, it looks wild, but it all had a purpose, didn't it? Right, like I'm sure, you know, all these, these vents had, had specific purposes for them. When this car seems generally lower than a regular Corvette, it almost seems like you need this hood dome to provide room for the engine because the hood's so much lower. Correct. What was under the hood of this car? 377 cubic inch, pushed out about a 485 horsepower. I mean, at the time, that had to be one of the biggest small blocks anyone had ever built. Absolutely, that thing's a monster. And this is a lightweight car. Uh, does that mean it was stripped out of everything and maybe did lightweight fiberglass, or where did the lightweight come from? It, exactly what you were saying. They stripped everything they could off this car. Now, do you know who owns this car, and does he actually drive it? This is Larry Bowman's car, and he actually does drive this car. On I've the street? Seen, yes, I've seen uh, videos of him going to a cruise event. Does this car have mufflers on it, or does it make uh, quite a spectacle on the road? This is straight pipes, and it's pretty loud. You can hear it from a mile away. Oh, yes. What about things like uh, hood straps and lack of windshield wipers? Does that go right back to the racing days? Of course, yes. So given the timing of this car, would this have been designed to compete against Shelby's Cobras? Yes, absolutely. Well, the Cobra was a smaller, lighter car, and it seems like this uh, Grand Sport required pretty big wheels and tires to compete with that. Is that why it has these big flares and giant Halibrands? Yes, that's exactly why. Uh, you can see how big, I mean, they're pretty wide in the back for this, for this era. Not only does it have a fiberglass extension, it even has a small aluminum one. Right. Were those Halibrands kind of characteristic of race cars back in the 60s? Halibrand back then was only making race car wheels. Okay. And they, made, they must have made the best ones because everyone seemed to use them. Absolutely. Now, how many of these Grand Sports were built and how many still exist? There were five built and all five are still in privately owned hands. Well, I'm not surprised. It's a gorgeous car. If I had one, I wouldn't let it slip through my fingers. Yeah, me neither. This is a 1967 L88 Coupe. And I think to a lot of Corvette collectors, this would be the ultimate Corvette. 
Why does this car have so much appeal, Carpo? 67 L88, there was only 20 of them built. Uh, high, high horsepower. And that L88 was a special racing engine, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it had special heads, uh, bigger carburetor. And I understand it was rated at 430 horsepower, which is even less than some of the other big blocks, but in fact, it was the most powerful engine. It was. It was rated, I believe, about 450. It was actual rating was 450, 460, only because of insurance purposes. And if you got an L88, did you also have to leave out radio and heater and things like that, or could you get those options with an L88? That would have been radio delete. Okay, so it really was intended to hit the track somewhere. Right. Now we're moving on to another generation of Corvettes, the C3. And this is a 1968 model, which was the first year of the C3. Why did you uh, pick this particular car, Carpo, for the exhibition? I picked this car because I, uh, I know the owner, obviously, but uh, Jeff Reed. But this car actually has 4,800 miles on it. It has the original paint, has the original tires. Everything's original about this car, even the fan belts and the hoses. How do you end up with a car that's uh, 45 years old with only 4,000 miles on it? It happens. I see them quite often, actually, these days, because people just held on to them. They knew what they were worth. Plus, this is an L88. They only made 80 of them in 68. Uh, as I recall, one of the biggest differences was this had wider wheels and tires on it than the uh, C2 did. Yes, it did. But mechanically, other than that, they were pretty similar. You can take the chassis parts off of this and put it on a C2. It really says a lot for the C2 chassis because the C2 started in 63. This started in 68 and remained in production till 82. So basically that same chassis was in production for the better part of 20 years. It was, and, and certain, after about, I believe it's about 73, 74, the chassis is a little different on the kickups. So if you wanted to put this body on a later chassis, all you'd have to do is modify the body, the, the inner structure a little bit, but it's pretty much the same. Now the only difference between this chassis and let's say a 6364, it would have different brakes on it because all 6364s had drum brakes. Gotcha. Also, the bodywork on these C3s remained fairly similar, although at some point they got rid of the chrome bumpers and went to the plastic yes. integrated bumpers. Mm -hmm. When did that happen? That happened in 73. 73 had a rubber bumper in the front and metal bumpers in the back. And then later on, they eventually got rubber bumpers all around. 74 had rubber bumpers all the way around. Well, this car still really stands out on the road. It's just so voluptuous with its curves. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a cartoon car in some ways. I agree, yeah. How are these doing among the collectors? These are doing very well. Uh, an example exactly like this car that was fully restored uh, sold last year at Mecham for 880000 isn't that quite a bit more than it was a few years ago? There was a time when these were in the shadow of the C2s, but now they're kind of coming into their own? Yes, they are. This is a C3 racing Corvette, and it's a very, very interesting car. Yeah, you know, this is uh, one of five 1969 lightweight L88 Corvettes. It had an open chamber hood, and when it left St. Louis, it was picked up by the race team, which, you know, being here at the Peterson is pretty cool because this car started in St. Louis, but came out to California to run SCCA A production, and the history of this car, Herb Kaplan was the original driver. They called him the Jewish Kamikaze, and there's a reason for that. Of 49 races this car was entered in, it won 46. And that's SCCAA production? Yes, sir. From, it won the championship in 69, 70, 71, and then kind of went into a garage. And in 1978, Phyllis Styers, the owner of the car, convinced Elliot Forbes Robinson he should campaign it, and campaign it he, he did. They won the championship again in 78. The car qualified to go to the runoffs in Road Atlanta. And needless to say that uh, Elliott won that race, came off the track, went into a garage, and the car looks today just like it did in 1978. What, what made this a lightweight Corvette? Well, you know, a lot of people think the lightweight was the fiberglass, which is a misnomer. When the car left the factory, the flares were in the back. It had a early version of the L88. That you mean the flares were not installed? Not they installed. Were... They, it was a production car, production L88, and 
the lightweight was more in reference to the engine design than the body design. And when you tell people it's lightweight, they think, oh, they lighten the fiberglass, but that's not quite the case. The Owens Corning Corvettes were part of this uh, group of cars as well as the, what they call the Rebel Flag Corvette. And uh, this was pretty neat because here at the Peterson for the Corvette 60th anniversary, uh, none other than Dick Goldstrand comes up and he said, oh yeah, I drove that car. Paul Reinhardt said, well, I was part of the team that drove it on a four hour race. So, you know, even though you think you know the history of a car, you put the car out in the public's eyes and you always find out more than you ever dreamed was, you know, you said this car won a championship in 78, and it's actually a 69, but the C3 stayed in production for a long time, didn't it? Up until 1982, and uh, certainly in the early days of road racing, cars stayed on the track for a number of years until something better came along. They just changed motors, changed the roll cage. This car happens to have a NASCAR-style roll cage on it. Was this originally a convertible? Originally a convertible. Left uh, St. Louis and driven out to the greater LA area and converted to a race car. Very good, thanks. We're here with another race car. This is called the Sundowner and it's from 1968. What's special about this car, Carpo? Uh, it was, in 1982, it was the fastest production car ever to hit 240 miles an hour. So this ran at Bonneville on the Salt? Yes. What was under the hood? It had a big block Chevrolet twin turbocharged. Who built that engine? I'm not sure who built that one, but in 75 when they built this car into a race car, it was Kehoe, McKinney, and Gail Banks. And so, he built that engine. So you talk about this being turned into a race car in 75. It was just probably a used Corvette someone bought as a foundation for the race car? Yes, it was. Well, you can see those Bonneville details, things like the full moon hubcaps and other evidence of streamlining. What else do you do to make a car work at Bonneville? Well, especially on this car, you can see in the front end, it's got the metal, the, uh, let, the, well, the weights, you weight it down. Is that to keep the car on the ground to keep from losing control? Oh, yeah. I flipped a few years ago myself at Bonneville and uh, learned about the absence of downforce, and you can pay for it pretty dearly out there. Oh, yeah. Does this car still run? This car still runs with a twin turbocharged small block Chevy. Love to get out there and see it run. Yeah, you should. Uh, a couple years ago, this thing, the top flew off and went up 50 feet. Did uh, the driver crash? No, he didn't. Lucky guy. Very lucky. So this is yet another generation of Corvette, the C4, which came out in 1984. What do you know about this particular car? Uh, John, this car, 84 obviously, it's all original, original paint, original interior, uh, I, and it's very, very low miles. I don't know exactly what the mileage is, but this, this gentleman bought this car at the dealership, and as you can see, it's got stripes on it. Now, this was very popular back in the day, so this was actually done at the dealership. Well, this car really brings back memories because I was a car and driver when this one was introduced. And I remember it had a 350 V8, it had mm -hmm. twin throttle body injection, and it had an all new chassis with aluminum control arms. It was very sophisticated, but the early versions of this car did not ride and handle well at all, and they weren't even all that fast. My, actually, my uncle had bought a brand new one, and it was in the shop, I, I couldn't tell you how many times, in the beginning. Well, this car had a pretty long life because it went on until 97 or 98 and really improved. But, you know, it took a big step forward in, with the 85 models. And that was a, they got more power then and really improved the chassis. In the collector's world, does the C4 fit anywhere? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the styling, I mean, compared to going from a C3 to something like this was innovative. I mean, well, and it was a ground up new car because not only is yeah. the body completely different, the, the chassis, chassis was completely is... different as well. But the, are, but are, are they starting to be collectible? Because for a long time, these cars were just used cars and nothing special. Right. No, they are very, very collectible. Which versions of the C4 seem to draw the collectors? I would say anywhere from 84 to 86, somewhere around there. And what about the, uh, the ZR1 cars, the Lotus engine cars? Are those special these days? Very special. You don't see those on the road anymore at all. And you don't very rarely see them at car shows. You know, it's amazing because I remember when those cars came out and uh, as the chief engineer, he wanted to build a king of the hill Corvette that was going to be faster and better than anyone. And he went to Lotus for that special engine and they were just rocket ships when what was it, 88, 89 when they came out yeah. roughly? And don't forget, those were wider bodies on the back. 
That's right. But the wider body was almost indistinguishable because it even started in the door and right. it was so gradually done. In fact, if you look back here, the telltale was right here is the antenna opening and this is only about an inch from the corner of this car. And mm -hmm. on those uh, ZR1s, it was more like yeah. four inches in. And that was really the easiest way to tell that you had mm -hmm. that special car. Yeah. This is a 2004 C5 convertible. C5 was introduced in 97, and this is actually the, the last year for that fifth generation. But it was as significant as the C4 in its day. All new bodywork, all new chassis, and in fact, underneath it, it has those hydro-formed steel rails that run front to back, and those went on into the C6, and in a certain form, they even exist in the upcoming C7. The styling was pretty controversial because it was a big change over the C4. How did the Corvette community react to this car? Uh, some positive, some negative. It was just, it's just like the C7. They, some people hated it. And was it simply because it was a change or the car was even maybe a little bit bigger? Uh, where, where, where did the concern come from? I think it was both, but they, they felt that Chevrolet was going in the wrong direction as far as styling goes. It was interesting because mechanically we really liked this car because C4 had been in production for a long time and by the time this car appeared, C4 was essentially obsolete. So this was a big step forward. But I have to say, we weren't totally sure about the styling either. That big butt look uh, right. turned a lot of people off. Right. What about this uh, <coughs> special edition version? It seemed that by this time frame, there were an awful lot of special edition Corvettes, much more so than there had been earlier. Is that how you guys saw it too? Yeah, that's how we saw it. I mean, this one's, uh, I believe they built 44 of these. These were the parade car for Indianapolis, uh, this being number 16. But yeah, we, we, we thought the same thing. Are these special edition cars all collectible? Because, I mean, at the time they were purported to be collectible, but do they really have a lot more value than the regular cars? Yes, they do. But do they have kind of the same increase in value that L88s and tanker cars did in the old days? No, completely different. Yeah, I mean, those cars seem to have more substance to their speciality than these do. Of course, yeah. At this point, are these starting to be collectible or are they just used cars? Um, some of them are and some of them aren't. Which ones are collectible in this group? I would have to say special cars like this, uh, pace cars, uh, or the parade cars, excuse me, and uh, probably Z06s. And the Z06 started with this era and uh, not only had higher performance, but there was a version with titanium mufflers even, right. which was kind of like a world first. And, right. uh, you know, goes back to the Corvette of the 60s when it was really a technological leader. I mean, I remember the first ride I had in a Z06 and uh, you, know, you couldn't get that kind of performance out of these kind of cars until then. Well, that was amazing. Uh, let's move on to the current C6 and maybe an even higher performance variant of the Corvette. Yes. This is a 2010 Corvette ZR1, and it's the highest performance production Corvette ever built. Now, the C6 came out in the 2005 model year, and it actually is heavily based on the previous C5, but it does have upgraded suspension geometry, and interestingly enough, the car actually shrank. It's a little bit shorter and narrower than the C5 was because Chevrolet wanted the C6 to compete more directly with cars like the Porsche. And a lot of people always felt that the Corvette was just big and heavy. And in the case of the C6, it actually wasn't any bigger or heavier than a Porsche 911. And it provided the perfect foundation for producing the ZR1 variant, which was the fastest and highest performance production Corvette ever built. There you have it, the 60-year history of the Corvette summarized in these 13 special cars. But as interesting as those cars are, they barely scratch the rich history of the Corvette. If you're a Corvette nut, you owe it to yourself to come here and take a look at these cars. I'm Chubba Chara. See you next time.